Just hours after Ukrainian President Zelensky sharply criticized NATO for saying that his country isn't ready to join the alliance, President Biden and allies reassuring him at their summit in Lithuania, but giving, of course, no specific timeline. I sat down for a one-on-one -on -one interview today with Boris Johnson, Britain's former prime minister, who insists there's no excuse for delaying Ukraine's membership. Here's my conversation. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much Laura. for joining us here today. Thank you so much. And congratulations, I think, are in order on the birth of your son. Congratulations to you. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you. This has been quite a week, as you can imagine. I want to begin with what's happening in NATO because President Zelensky is quite upset for NATO not having a particular timeline or a definitive one on the table for when Ukraine might be considered for admission to membership. I wonder if you think that right now, given all that's happened and is currently occurring, should an exception be made for Ukraine to be accepted in light of them being embroiled in an active conflict? Laura, I think it's very, very important that we establish that Ukraine is on the path now to NATO membership. There can be no possible excuse or reason uh, to keep faffing around and, and delaying. The last remaining objection, you remember, was that it was going to be provocative to Vladimir Putin. Well, we've seen uh, what happens when you don't have Ukraine in NATO. Uh, you provoke the worst war in Europe for, for 80 years. You need, you need Ukraine in uh, for certainty, uh, for stability, and for the security, not just of, of Ukraine, but of, of Russia as well. So everybody knows where the boundaries are and everybody knows who's protecting whom. The president of Ukraine talked about uncertainty, the word you're using as well, as a kind of weakness and the idea of being able to delineate the power dynamic, the role of the different countries, and of course, the longevity of this now 500 plus day invasion into Ukraine. Does it factor in this somehow going to be an in inevitable notion that Ukraine will join the alliance in light of all those things? Yeah, Ukraine's going to join the alliance. Uh, but first of all, Ukraine's got to win. And that's absolutely crucial. And I just say to everybody, you know, if they think there's a if you think there's a there's a negotiated solution, uh, we can do with Vladimir Putin, you know, forget about it. There's no way that uh, he's going to do a, a trade of, of land for peace. He's going to continue to keep uh, attacking Ukraine if he possibly can. That's clear from, from everything he's done. So the only way through this thing is for the Ukrainians to win. We need to keep supplying them with the weaponry that they need. And we're being very effective in that. In that it's good that we're now training them in the use of the, the F-16s in the, in the jets. But after that, two things happen. First of all, we're going, to, we're going to make some security guarantees. As you've heard from the NATO summit, some countries are going in advance of NATO membership, so like the UK and, and the US. And we're saying we're going to help fortify Ukraine, give it NATO quality equipment, send our troops there, put you know, British soldiers, why not British troops, in bases in Ukraine, and so kind of fortify the quills of the Ukrainian porcupine that it is never attacked again by, by Russia. That's step one. Step two is to negotiate full uh, NATO membership. And, I'm, and that, I think that's now a question of, of when, not if. Speaking of the, the former aspect of the quills of the Ukrainian porcupine, as you pointed out, one of the aspects of trying to arm and trying to support Ukraine has been the provision or the decision to now provide cluster munitions to Ukraine. In fact, President Zelensky spoke to the reporters earlier today to suggest, look, I know people have been very, very critical of the use of this particular notion. He alerted the public, of course, reminding them that Russia has within its own weapon, or weapon arsenal similar um, things that have been banned by other nations. You, the UK has denounced the US over the decision to send these cluster munitions. Are you against President Biden's decision to send these cluster munitions? No, Laura, I'm for what the president has done. And I think it is brave and right. It was a difficult decision. Look, the, the UK is a signatory, like many countries, of the anti-cluster munitions uh, weapons convention. And that's because traditionally, historically, these weapons have been used in a way that leaves behind little bomblets, uh, little uh, bits of ordnance lying around in fields in the developing world where they're picked up by kids and have appalling consequences. And so that's why there's been a general reluctance to, to see the use of, 
the proliferation of cluster munitions. But this is a very different case. We're talking about helping the Ukrainians to win a war in their own country, when what they need to do is to punch through these very heavily uh, protected Russian dugouts and, and trenches, uh, get the Russians out of the, of the land bridge as fast as possible. Mr. Prime Minister, as you well know, recently, President Vladimir Putin faced a short-lived rebellion from the Wagner Group. Um, of course, um, Prigozhin has said he was not engaged in a rebellion. He was a, engaged in a protest. You can quibble with whether there's the accuracy of that statement or believability of that. But I wonder what you made of that short-lived rebellion. And do you think that Vladimir Putin's grip on power is now, as a result, in peril? Look, I think all sorts of people have come up with all sorts of theories about what was really happening and they're claiming that it was now all kind of uh, orchestrated by, by Putin to, to show that, you know, there could be someone worse than, uh, than Putin or, or whatever. I think, frankly, that's a load of baloney. I think that uh, what happened was that uh, this guy Prigozhin uh, showed that he's no great respecter of Vladimir Putin. He showed he's no great respecter of the, of the, of the authority of the, of the Kremlin. And I think that sent a real signal around the world about the political mortality of Vladimir Putin. One could imagine perhaps his life, given the fact that Putin is no real friend of those who oppose him. Do you think Prigozhin's life is at risk as a result of him identifying or suggesting that it was propaganda based, this entire invasion and trying to persuade the Russian people and the military to go along with what Putin wanted, even when there was not the evidence that was there to support his reasoning. I think you're absolutely right. I think that it was a, a, a most extraordinary moment when Prigozhin, who everybody has hitherto believed to be kind of Putin's Jeeves, his sort of his manservant, his, you know, the guy who, who hands him the, uh, the cordon bleu cooking or, or, or whatever, suddenly seemed to rebel and and, and said that the, the war in Ukraine wasn't justified. And I, I think that the, the impact is going to be uh, very, very considerable. I, whether Prigozhin's own uh, physical uh, safety uh, can be guaranteed or not, I, I don't know, Laura. I think the, the truth is that, you know, the, there may be, uh, he may yet get his comeuppance. On the other hand, he did see Putin, as, as we understand it, just a few hours after his abortive coup. When it comes to Ukraine, of course, we are about a year and a half now away, Mr. Prime Minister, from a presidential election. There is a purported front runner who has been the president before, of course, and speaking of Donald Trump. What do you think a potential Donald Trump second term might do for support for the country of Ukraine? Would it be in jeopardy? Never forget, Laura, that whatever people say about uh, President Trump, it was Donald Trump who authorized the, uh, the shipment of those Javelin missiles to Ukraine, uh, which I think were indispensable in uh, breaking the taboo on arming the Ukraines in, in the way that so many other countries, particularly the UK, have done. And I can tell you frankly that when I took the decision to send uh, NLAW, uh, shoulder-launched uh, anti-tank weaponry from the UK to, to help the Ukrainians. That was very much encouraged by what President Trump had already done in sending the, the javelins. The javelins were very important. So, you know, the, the President Trump has a, a, a strong record already in helping the Ukrainians. I, I appreciate that in the, you know, it's not for me to comment on, on, on what's happening in the uh, American presidential uh, campaign. I can appreciate that all sorts of people will say all sorts of things. Uh, but I believe very strongly that uh, when that election is finished, and if, if it were, if President Trump were to be elected, or if, indeed if President Biden were to, to continue, I have absolutely no doubt that the interests of the United States of America would remain four square behind freedom and Ukraine. Um, you know, we are here in the United States, obviously, grappling with a whole host of issues surrounding governmental transparency and the like. And I know the UK and the world is still coming to terms with the loss 
of the COVID-19 outbreak. And there has been an inquiry, of course, um, into the government, your government's handling of the crisis. And it stands very important to get to the bottom of a number of issues. You have been asked to hand over all of your WhatsApp messages and phones from the period that was requested. Why haven't you done so in the investigation? I'm very happy to, this is a, this is a, a pretty abstruse issue. There's a, as, you, as you rightly say, there's, a, there's a, an inquiry going on. It's very important that they, they have the access to the maximum possible information. As it happens, I'm very happy for my stuff to be handed over uh, in unredacted form and for the head of the inquiry, Dame Heather Hallett, to have a look and say, well, you know, this is relevant, this isn't relevant. Uh, and the, the, there is an objection from the UK government itself, which I don't any longer represent, and they, you know, they're just anxious that uh, in future ministers' correspondence should not be handed over wholesale uh, to inquiries. As it happens in my own particular case, that's fine. I want, I want the whole thing out there. 